Okay, um, time to make a start, I think. It's, the energy has kind of just got to that peak where we re we're ready to listen, I think. Um, so I'd just like to say um, welcome to uh, TORCH, the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities, the acronym that we're, we're very proud of, T-O-R-C-H. Um, my name is Elika, Elika Burma, and I am the director of TORCH. Um, TORCH fosters, stimulates, and supports interdisciplinary research in the humanities, and we are the home and the hub of a whole range of panels, talks, discussions, seminars, which examine in one shape, form, or another the value of the humanities, which is precisely what, what draws us here today. Um, Helen Small, my, my colleague, is going to chair this panel. We're delighted to be featuring and to be talking about Don Drakeman's important book, Why We Need the Humanities, here today from several different perspectives. Um, so it just remains for me to say uh, a word of introduction about Helen. Helen is, um, the, is a professor in, Engl in English literature. And she is also, uh, amongst other books, the author of um, uh, The Value of the Humanities, which is a really significant analysis of the different arguments for defenses of the humanities that have been mounted across the 19th and into the 20th centuries. Um, and I can't think of a better person, really, to, to introduce and to set up this panel for you than Helen Small. Thank you very much, Elika. Uh, I understand that this acoustic can be a bit of a challenge, so if there's any problem, please flag in the air and we will do our best to adapt. It's a huge pleasure to introduce this panel, um, uh, cunningly chosen um, for their competence to address the really diverse range of, of topics that are treated in Don's book. I'm going to introduce Don last, and in his own words, and give a very brief um, uh, introductory label, if you like, to the three respondents. Stefan Collini is Professor of Intellectual History and of English Literature at the University of Cambridge. Um, you will know him, I'm sure, as uh, one of our most prominent and important and effective advocates for the humanities. Uh, so that's the expertise that he brings to Don's book, uh, The Advocacy Angle. Jay Sexton is a fellow and tutor, associate professor in American history at Corpus. So he brings a historian's angle, a transatlantic angle, uh, and I assume he also brings his Americanism to the debate. <laughs> Uh, Richard Eakins, a compatriot of mine from New Zealand originally, um, is tutorial fellow in law at St. John's College, uh, who has worked as judge's clerk at the High Court of New Zealand in Auckland um, before coming here. That's as much as I'm going to say. There is more detail about them on a sheet here if you're interested at the end, but we'd like to get to the core of the talk today. I'm going to introduce Don in his own words. This is from the preface. Um, of the book, but before I say this, I would just like to acknowledge that he has been from the founding of Torch a really fantastic friend um, and supporter for this institution. So we're very glad um, to have him here as a friend, as well as the object of intellectual discussion today. This is what he has to say about his own credentials for entering the value of the humanities debate from a different angle from what most of us are competent to bring to it within the academy. He says, I have a PhD in religion and a law degree. I have taught for two decades at Princeton and Notre Dame, primarily in courses on civil liberties and constitutional interpretation. And I've written books for academic presses on the intersection of law, religion, history, and politics. At the same time, I've spent over a quarter of a century founding and running biotechnology companies as an entrepreneur, executive, and venture capitalist, generally seeking to commercialize academic research in the life sciences in the United States and Europe. On numerous occasions, I've met with Wall Street investors or global pharmaceutical companies during the business day, and then led a group of students through a discussion of civil liberties in the evening. That gives you the credential ready. He speaks, as I said, from a different place, from someone who's been on the side of the funder, as well as those asking for funding for the humanities. And he brings a real open-mindedness, I think, to that quite often vexed terrain of how far we want to instrumentalize what we do. I'll turn over in order in which they're sitting, first to Stefan, then to Jay, then to Richard, and then Don has the right of reply. If he springs to his feet, you know he's getting agitated. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Helen very generously said uh, that you might 
know my name. I just want to say you've got to be very careful not to confuse me with my namesake, also called Stefan Collini, um, who, I, to gather from what is reported in the press, holds a lot of very extreme and very purist views and would be predicted to dislike or disagree with Don's book. I can't speak for him, but this Stefan Collini uh, actually wants to recommend the book to you very much. Uh, as you will have gathered, I think, from his range of expertise, it's a different kind of book about the humanities. But uh, just to single out two chapters in it, the two major chapters, I think, on his discussions of the ways in which decisions about investment and research and development are made in the life sciences, or the chapter in uh, discussing, discussing the ways in which debates around the Constitution in the states not only touch on large issues that we think of as being in some sense at the heart of the humanities, but actually also draw directly on humanities scholarship. And those uh, I would very much recommend to everybody, and I think Helen is right, that it brings a very different perspective. Now, obviously, I wouldn't be earning my keep if all I do is say I agree with everything he says. So I've got uh, two, I think, slight differences of emphasis, and then maybe one uh, reservation at the very end. The first of these is um, that Don uses the term, as he admits, I think, the humanities in a slightly uh, different way from a lot of usage. I'm not uh, terribly keen on the term in itself for intellectual purposes. Obviously, we have to use it for all kinds of institutional purposes. But the disciplines that Don most often cites are things like philosophy, sociology, political science, and uh, history. And the features of these disciplines he largely refers to are those that bear on public policy discussion. That's all excellent, as I've said. But I guess it risks not being entirely representative of what humanities scholars mostly do most of the time. That is to say, I think the much more detailed, much more empirical, often somewhat more remote uh, topics of research and manner of research uh, is also an essential part of the humanities disciplines. And we need, I think, to frame our descriptions of what we do in ways that provide an account of, and in the right context, justification for those sorts of inquiries, and not just those that bear on public life or public policy in a direct way. Uh, the humanities debate, I think, often turns on things which are really about philosophy and political theory, to some extent the great classics of literature, but we also need to broaden it enough to take into account the person who you know, can put together the inscription on a ceramic pot from 2,000 years ago and the person who really knows about uh, medieval land holding and so on. So that's one way, I think, in which we could expend, extend the um, thought about the humanities here. The second slight difference of emphasis is that, as we all know, uh, justification and persuasion are very context-dependent activities. And we always have to ask who, whom, what, and so on. Uh, there's not one all-purpose statement for this kind of thing. Now, uh, quite reasonably, Don's discussion focuses on the situation in which representatives of the humanities are addressing fundamentally funders, maybe legislators, possibly donors, but that's the main context. I think the, uh, that's all to the good, but again, the uh, anxiety we can have is that where that becomes the way of framing our justifications, we then internalize that as the way of understanding what we do. And we start, if we do that quite often with, I think, a somewhat defensive view that it's a, a position under pressure and a position that needs to justify itself in other terms. And I think one of the things that happens, I don't think this happens in Don's book itself, but I think one of the things that can happen with this is that we get a kind of uh, always deferred loop of anxiety that we are using the terms that will persuade someone else. So academics, for example, often think they're going to persuade their managers of a particular case. Their managers often think they're going to persuade, let's say in this country, officials in Whitehall. Officials in Whitehall think they're going to persuade their ministers. Ministers think they're going to persuade their electorate. The thing is in some way couched as uh, a losing argument. Um, and I think we shouldn't take that framework as the only context or the only forum in which we try and develop ways of talking about the humanities, although we know for practical purposes funding issues press on us very heavily, but I think we've got to take a wider perspective than that. <clears throat> 
the third point, and this is, uh, again, I think really only a difference of emphasis, but maybe one I'd be very interested to hear what Don wants to say about this. Uh, I think the sort of language we do use to talk about the humanities can become one of the things that determines what we press our colleagues to do. Indeed, what we as come to aspire to do ourselves and think is worth doing. Um, Don's argument, quite rightly, refers often to how humanities scholars can best serve the common good and, uh, again, he says, demonstrate their usefulness to society. And it's very hard to disagree with that, obviously. But I think the public policy framework then can, if we're not careful, insidiously start to be the one that matters most. And then we start to favor one kind of work over another, not always, I think, for the best reasons. I would say that in this country, the current version of the impact requirement in the REF has some of this effect, that good work can be somewhat undervalued because it can't yield the same kind of evidence for impact and therefore for various other benefits for a university in the current funding situation. And so scholars are almost insidiously moved towards this. They're rewarded for doing it. They may get promoted more, they get outside funding more, and slowly the ecology in which we work has come to internalize that as really a difference of value, when in fact it's one, I would say, rather pragmatic decision that we make given the requirements on us. Now, I don't think <coughs> that uh, Don's much more sophisticated discussion actually does that, but I would like to hear what he thinks about how we need to either supplement or in some way extend the kind of case he makes, which I would say applies to maybe a minority of work in the humanities, where his case I think is extremely cogent, to dovetail with a language we need to use in which the wider range of work in the humanities is fully recognized, one is not prioritized over another, and at the same time, offers an account of what's valuable about it. And that's, I think, what we need. I'll stop there. Thank you. I want to start by apologizing on behalf of my other panelists for not getting the memo about the dress code change today. <laughs> uh, I want to uh, thank Don for, for coming all this way. I want to thank him uh, for being such a champion, which is the word, the champion for the humanities, but also a friend of, of this university, um, someone who's been very generous with his time, generous with his time to me at the uh, Rothermere American Institute, and I'm grateful for that. I'm also grateful for having the opportunity to read the book. I found myself agreeing with it. I found its principal arguments about the value of the humanities very convincing. But more than that, I found myself convinced by what is really his principal point, which is how the humanities need to be better at engaging, engaging with policymakers, as we've just heard, and with wider publics. Just as important, as we all know, as the validity of an argument is how it's presented, I thought it was presented uh, not only in an informative way, in a very eclectic way. Very interesting, wide-ranging examples in there. And if we're all going to take turns t telling stories about our namesakes elsewhere, the other Jay Sexton, if you Google him, uh, would agree with this book very much. He is a biology professor in Oregon, I believe. And there's lots of stuff in here about biomedical research and healthcare and how the humanities and an appreciation of the humanities can actually be rewarding outside of the field. I also found it very incisive in its criticisms, but also generous in how those criticisms were advanced of uh, particular scholars or particular trends. Uh, more on that in a second. And finally, as someone employed by Oxford, I must say something about the Cover. Um, there's a centuries-old Oxonian term for a cover like this. We call this a kick-ass cover. 
So thanks for that, Don. Um, I'm just going to really address one aspect of the book, and that is in chapter four, for those who have your, your copies handy. That's the chapter in which Don engages with the issue of political diversity or the lack of political diversity in higher education uh, using examples both from the United States and the United Kingdom. Though I think there might be some differences there that you might want to talk about in the Q&A. What I took to be the principal point here was really one that resonated with the overall argument of the book, and that is there needs to be more of a two-way street uh, in this sense, not just between the humanities and wider publics, um, but humanities scholars who tend to be on the political left and wider publics who, well, until recent times had been trending toward the right or the center right. And he makes a good case for how that kind of engagement could be of value. Um, and I think it's an important case to make because most colleagues uh, leaning on the left would probably see their role in one of two ways. One is that as an evangelist, evangelizing their positions to those who see differently, um, or probably more so to see their role as more as preaching to the choir, as addressing those who agree with them and taking debates on those terms and really ignoring um, what political opponents think. Uh, it's here, I think, that you get some of those really fair critiques of other scholars. Uh, the critique of Jill Lepore's book on the Tea Party. Um, even if you agree with Lepore's argument, um, as I generally do, I thought Don made a really important point that her political blinders were not only meaning that she didn't engage with a wider public, but that actually she was missing some of the most important questions about the American Constitution and the founding. Um, and that was a very important point indeed. So all agreement, this was the danger of this panel. Everyone here presumably likes the humanities. If you don't, <laughs> that would be good for a lively Q&A. But I just want to raise two questions or, or two categories of questions for, for Don. The first one won't spend much time on it. It's a simple one. Uh, where does one draw the line in terms of what ideas require constructive engagement? Um, so in my field, uh, the history of American foreign policy, if I took this literally, that I needed to engage with wider publics from different ideological perspectives um, who were writing and developing their own views on the history of American foreign policy, I would spend almost all of my time dealing with outrageous conspiracy theorists, um, both from within the United States and beyond. Um, now, that's a, taking the argument to the extreme, but where do we draw the line and, and who determines where we draw the line? Because we do have, at the end of the day, important academic business that must take precedence, right? And you're saying that business can be consonant with a wider engagement, but not if the engagement is outside the realm of some agreed standard of what are important issues to be addressed. So that, that's the, the first issue. The second issue, I suppose, is dovetailing on what was just said. How is this diversity best achieved, this political diversity? How is it best achieved? Here, we could think about the very different models in the UK, a more centralized model, one in which uh, central funding, central regulations uh, can be used or deployed to achieve certain objectives. Um, is that been a good thing for political diversity? Um, or has it not? What has the U.S. decentralized model done? What has it been successful at? What has it not been very successful at? And I have to say, I'm struck by the similarity in outcomes. I will stand corrected. Don knows a lot more about this than I do. But I am struck by, despite these different structures, a very similar outcome. And one of the outcomes is those on the political right tend to be in intellectual silos within liberal universities. Um, we have run some series at the Rothermere American Institute, predominantly with conservative scholars, and they're attended by a smaller group of people than go to the rest of our programming, and they tend to be very different people than go to that. And that's clearly not the objective that chapter four lays out. How do we avoid that problem? 
Similarly, how do we incentivize um, academics to pursue the goal that Don outlines to achieve political diversity? Um, how do we make appointment practices take this on board? How might we square this with the other issue on the agenda when it comes to diversifying faculty, and that is, of course, gender diversity, uh, racial diversity. It would make a whole lot of sense, wouldn't it, to treat all of these issues together. They're all related. Um, that's really not how it's operating right now. And in fact, it might be the case that the momentum is going against the political diversity that Don is making the case for. So how can we make this objective work in the academic context in which we operate today? Thank you. Well, like uh, the other panelists, I found it a, a very stimulating book, and I'm most grateful to have a chance to say a few words about it. What I thought I'd do is say briefly how I understood the project Don's project and what I made of it, uh, address briefly how the range of ways in which public decision makers might draw on the humanities, and then say something more particular about law and uh, raise a few concerns about how judges might act if they, if they heeded Don's advice. Uh, and then very, very briefly, a word or two about the new improved humanities that Don uh, is hoping for. So as, as my fellow panelists have said, the book is a contribution to a reflection on, rather, the contribution the humanities may make to the common good, the study of the humanities. And of course, the study of the humanities, in one sense, is part of the common good, in a vital, important, direct way, uh, being a um, pursuit of knowledge in its own right. But there's another important sense, of course, in which it may contribute to our living well together. It seems um, eminently sensible to articulate that second sense, both for the benefit of public funding bodies deciding whether to support philosophy departments or history departments, or whether to see them as, as luxuries, uh, but also so that decision makers, including maybe ordinary voters, don't think that science, economics are the only game in town, that there are other ways of seeing things, other dimensions of value. So I think Don is uh, very successfully identifying the importance of sound philosophical foundations, noting the importance of one's conclusions having uh, some grounding in particular moral, political premises, and imploring decision makers to see the need to engage with a, a broad array of perspectives on point and maybe scholarly work on point. So he's picking out, it seems, sometimes um, uh, in expressed terms almost, the dangers of an isolated technocracy, one that's isolated intellectually and culturally, fails to see, fails to contest its own assumptions. And scholars, uh, humanity scholars, may have a particular role to play in ending that isolation. But as Don discusses near the end of the book, uh, we or they may risk an isolation of our own. Well, Don talks often about uh, decision makers, public decision makers, drawing on the humanities or seeking out help from the humanities. What might that look like? Well, it might involve simply reading scholarly work, citing it, uh, plagiarizing it, as judges do often, hearing expert evidence, perhaps, from scholars. Or maybe it doesn't involve any such direct self-conscious action. It might just be the decision makers in question are embedded in a culture that's formed by this, this mode of thinking. And in that regard, one can note that very many judges are trained in the humanities. And if law counts as a humanities, then practically all are in some way. And the, tr the same would be true in a way for uh, the civil service, at least uh, a few years ago, perhaps. Well, another possibility might be some of the special commissions of the presidential bioethics kind that, uh, that Don discusses a few times, where there's a thinking out loud about uh, without actual decision-making power, but thinking out loud about the perspectives that should come to bear in a way that might inform the, the president's later decision-making or inform Congress or uh, executive agencies. But possibly what one needs here is just less technocracy, more public legislative engagement with the relevant decisions. They're not settled by uh, the, the elite in question acting on a, a default set of norms. And Don discusses the virtues of legislatures by comparison with, say, courts or or uh, small commissions of, of civil servants. They're more diverse, more open, and so forth. But the capacity of those bodies, legislatures, the general public, to make sound decisions might well turn on how rich, how supportive the public and political culture is. And it might be here that in enriching that culture, hopefully maybe elevating it, uh, humanity scholars may have a role to play most directly in a range of different ways. 
So it looks to me as if help from the humanities covers a very wide range of, of possibilities. And that array of options matters, I think, because they might not all be consistent, these possibilities, and some may be more problematic than others. Although, of course, I think a sound reflection uh, with the advantage of the insight of the humanities might help explain why. So let me turn then to law and Supreme Court adjudication in particular. And the tale Don tells here, and tells it very well, because he knows it, knows it very well, it seems to me not to be a very attractive one, consisting of a lot of cherry picking, procedural impropriety, post-fact rationalisation. Uh, striking to see, and this is one of his uh, very nice examples, how the friendship of a Supreme Court judge with the historian next door can change the law. But to my mind, that's a bit appalling as well. It's grossly unjust to the parties in the dispute, who never get access to this, uh, this information until the decision arrives. And it's unjust on the, the general public who have to live with the result. And one can say something similar uh, if it's less procedurally unjust, but there's something problematic about the way judges very often use social science evidence. Not very good at handling it. Certainly not good at handling the fact of its constant change over time. It's not a good institutional structure for addressing this sort of material. Many judges are keen on, uh, on thinking in terms of political philosophy, are quite keen to become political philosophers. But often that's uh, a dangerous tendency uh, to observe. It comes at a high cost. And it often comes at the cost of ignoring the traditional wisdom to be found in the legal tradition itself, understanding of the limited judicial role that's outlined by Cook and Bacon and others. And it's part of a wider problem, really, of forgetting the, the insights of the legal political past. So a better historical understanding would help, but might well uh, involve more discipline, less um, venturing further or forth. So my point isn't judges should, can, get by with bad philosophy or bad history, uh, but it might be that they'll do well if they understand their own discipline, and that a risk of inviting them to draw on the help of the humanities is that it weakens their grasp of those insights. Well, the idea that judges should be political philosophers uh, is articulated with particular force and clarity by a very well-known um, political legal philosopher, Ronald Dawkins who it seems must be a kind of paradigm of the sort of engaged scholarship that Don has in mind. I'm not sure how often his work was cited in the Supreme Court, but without question was immensely influential, not just in relation to particular cases, but changing a whole uh, academic legal culture. And that's a culture, the culture of academic lawyers, that constrains but also empowers judges, and does so in different, different jurisdictions, different communities, in different ways, depending on the closeness of the academy and the bench. It's very close in Canada, not so close in America. And that's, in a lot of ways, a helpful relationship. It improves legal learning, improves legal practice. But it can be a dangerous one too, one that can rationalise, uh, or that rather can well, rationalise and sponsor some problematic um, developments. And at that point, when thinking about that relationship, the intellectual diversity of the academy might well be extremely important. It's not that judges are wholly isolated, they're nested within the, the bar, within the academy. But if the academy itself is intellectually isolated, then the connection might not help very much. And on some questions, in the legal academy certainly, which I'm familiar, there is a certain kind of groupthink. Not just in the sort of unremarkable way there are shared presuppositions and research methods, but uh, shared arrival at conclusions which are uh, often not the result really of uh, terribly careful scholarly work, and then a, a banishing of dissenters from the consensus. And unfortunately, I wonder if this is just an especially likely phenomena, phenomenon to take place when academics think their work is likely to be politically relevant, publicly relevant, if they think decision makers are or should be listening, then there may be an impulse to act politically. Now, if Don's right about the contribution that humanities make or should make to the common good, then what kind of academy should one hope for? Well, I think we should be hoping for, and I think he should, consistent with his, his premises, but he can, he can tell us, we should hope for one that's engaged and detached, and one that has some virtues, including virtues of patience, not being in a great rush to see a payoff from, from scholarship, one that's curious rather than foreclosing questions prematurely, but one that also has some charity, both towards colleagues who see things differently and towards others outside the academy who also see things differently. If his book uh, does anything to make it more likely this comes to pass, and I think it uh, has some promise of so doing, then it will also itself be a, an important contribution to the common good. So thank you, Don, for writing.
thank you all for coming, and I, I'm really grateful to the panelists uh, for being the first four and maybe the last to read my book. But um, uh, they were just terrific comments, and I, I think what we all share here you know, up in the front part of the chapel and probably share with all of you and the rest of the chapel is, is a, a devotion to the, the humanities, whatever piece of it grips us. And I should say that while I have come in, parachuted in from the real world, as it were, to, to speak up for the use and importance of the humanities, if you ask me why I do them, I don't do them to be useful. I do them because they're fascinating, they're challenging, they're frustrating sometimes, they're enriching. I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about the paper I just read or the paper I'm just about to write. That is, in my view, the best reason to study the humanities, to read the humanities, and to convey it, and hopefully some of that enthusiasm to others. But when it comes down to getting paid for being a university professor or what have you, somebody's got to say it's worth doing, that maybe the life sciences, which get the lion's share of the funding, uh, and where I have spent my business career and most of my, my adult life, um, ought not to be the sole focus, despite its, its obvious impact on health, impact on the development and transmission of knowledge, and impact on our economies in the forms of spin-off companies and jobs. So, so my, my goal was to say, that's, that's what I do. I, I, I'm an impact person, and I have seen where I've done that, that the humanities are constantly coming up at the core, not peripherally, but at the core of what we're doing. And they're really determining in many ways the future of all that investment, the 30 billion euros a year that Europe puts into life sciences basic research. So I won't recap that other than to say, if you want to know the long, boring explanation for that, it's in the book. Um, I, I'd like to respond to the really excellent questions, which are actually um, uh, far better than my answers will be. Uh, let me start with, with Jay's comment about political diversity. How do you do it and who should decide? The answer is, I don't know. But I think we ought to worry about it enough to ask the question. Uh, I have been involved in, in, in helping start and promote a, a center at Princeton University in, in the politics department that is generally seen as, as leaning to the right. It's mostly because the professor who leads it is uh, well known for leaning to the right. And I think having someone like that at Princeton University is a very good thing. And he's probably the most conservative faculty member there and he co-teaches a course with Cornell West, who was probably the most liberal faculty member there. And I think that's the sort of thing that Princeton University students ought to be exposed to. And I think my, my friends who are deeply uh, committed to the conservative cause get nervous whenever I say, you know, if the whole campus were full of conservatives, I'd be heading up the uh, program for progressives to be uh, brought to a uh, greater level of impact on campus. I really think engaging with the diversity of ideas and worrying about whether you're engaging with all the right ideas and asking all the right questions is the key thing rather than the answer of how to do it. Um, I think a, a similar point uh, comes up in Richard's comments about the judicial use of history and politics, which, again, if you look for it, you find it everywhere, political philosophy and historians popping up. Some of the most dreary, dry, old, musty books are popping up and having a very significant effect uh, on our constitutional law and therefore our religious and, and other liberties. Um, I think that, that having judges think about what they can learn from history and what they can learn from uh, the social sciences or the, the more quantitative social sciences is a really important thing. And all I'm going to say is, Richard, I'm writing that book now. So I hope to be back with you in a few years to tell you, actually, to, to help judges understand the limitations of the knowledge uh, that they get from these sources. So on the, this book, I'm encouraging them to look for it 
next one I'm going to say, but when you look for it, you need to be thoughtful about what it's good for. Uh, and finally, Stefan's uh, terrific uh, question and comments about impact. I think impact is a, is, a, is a very complicated thing to talk about in the context of the, the humanities. The life sciences people, it is no less complicated, but they've developed a better story. And part of my job in this book was to try to tell the story a little bit better for the humanities to say there is impact. But just like the life sciences impact, if you come up with a new discovery uh, about you know, the mouse spleen in your laboratory, the one in 10 or 20,000 chance that that actually has an effect on human health care won't be known for 20 to 30 to 50 years. And so we need to broaden our view of when we look at impact and what, what counts for impact, because we have to take the long view. Here at Oxford, you're, you're old enough, I would hope you could do that. Uh, we Americans sometimes want to know right now. And uh, that's the wrong question for both the life sciences and the humanities. And finally, I want to just give you a brief look at, at this notion of metrics, which gets, I think, scholars, generally speaking, very nervous about counting things, particularly in the humanities. And I, I, I want to share with you an argument that says uh, that this, all these metrics are just making a big mistake. I've spent, I've spent my life, again, trying to create new treatments for cancer. What I've learned is that the world's best managed companies, the pharmaceutical industry spends, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars trying to do this. They have every possible piece of advice for management consultants. They have metrics for everything. And every metric they have, they have the most of. They have more researchers. They have more patents. They have more research funding. Uh, they have more publications. They have everything except new drugs. You can measure all those things, but if you want to know where the new drugs are coming from, not just the most innovative drugs, but just numerically, more drugs are coming from a bunch of little biotech companies who you know, are run by people who've never run anything bigger than, in some cases, a, a, a university lab, and in other cases, a brass quintet. And so you have these startups that don't have many patents, that don't have many, any publications, that don't have any of those things you might measure. But at the end of the day, they have the one thing you want to have most. And so I think that metrics are, 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 are great if you have a known process, if you can find yourself what the physicians call a surrogate marker, which is if I measure this, I know that in a year I'll get that. But we can't do that in the humanities, and we can't do it in the life sciences. And we ought to try to, to, to convince people that they know less from metrics than they believe. And so my, my lesson to judges and to anyone who might count the impact of the academy is all the same. You know less than you think you know when you go around and collect the information you think is valuable. And that humility as to what you can actually know and how it applies to the real world is a lesson I think the humanities can convey as well. In the end, the humanities are intrinsically valuable. They are worth doing for no other reason that they're worth doing. But they can also enrich our communities, improve the common good, and we can convince people that they are essential, and we shouldn't be bashful about saying so. And that was my goal. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you all. Appreciate it very much.